So today I want to talk about uh, the semiotics of races and European perspectives. I will mostly use Austrian examples, but they are very generalizable in some ways and very unique in other ways. So let me start by introducing the problem. Uh, in the last two days, uh, in The Guardian, in sort of left liberal British newspaper, I found various interesting quotes or articles about the new racism or the new old racism appearing across the European Union or Europe, because Switzerland is obviously not part of the EU. Uh, for example, on Wednesday we had Swiss far right seeks to vote on minarets ban. So over 125,000 signatures were given to uh, have a referendum in Switzerland now about uh, building new minarets. Switzerland has three minarets right now for about 250,000 Muslims. Uh, similar uh, requests have also been uttered by the Austrian far-right politician Jörg Haider and by other politicians across the EU. Um, yesterday in The Guardian there was a large commentary, the persecution of gypsies is now the shame of Europe, Italy's campaign against the Roma has ominous echoes of its fascist past and the silence of our leaders is deafening. And you might have heard about the way the Roma are treated right now in Italy. Uh, fingerprints are going to be requested of each Roma and Roma child. Uh, and it's really, they really have become the new scapegoat, the new old scapegoat, because of course they were persecuted in Nazi times uh, as well. And finally, one of uh, the election campaign slogans of uh, Hans Christian Strache, of whom I will talk more today, from the Freedom Party in Austria, a right-wing uh, party, extremist right-wing party, who said in German, Lieber Schweinskotlet statt Minaret, which means preferably pork steaks instead of minarets, and which echoes sort of this uh, request for a ban of minarets. So what you see is that across the EU and Europe, we have a lot of uh, sort of <coughs> utterances, speeches, various uh, conversations, various kinds of uh, discourse, which are all uh, pointing to the exclusion of certain groups. And this is what I want to talk about today, forms of inclusion and exclusion, which are constructed via discourse. So to show you as a begin one of the posters, and my students know that poster well because it is a poster I use uh, quite frequently, um, not because I like it so much, but because it shows a lot of the details I want to focus on. Just to translate it briefly, uh, this is the mayor of Vienna on my right side, on my left side it is the Hans Christian Strache, whom I just mentioned, with the pork cutlets. Um, and uh, Strache, he's the leader of the Freedom Party, uh, is uh, during the campaign, election campaign in Vienna 2006, um, uh, asked uh, Mr. Heupel to come and to duel with him. So it's the use of a metaphor of war. Um, for the votes, and then you have on the one hand Heupel with a minaret in the background, and on the other hand uh, Strache with uh, the church, the most famous church in Vienna in the background, the Stephanskirche. And below you have you have the choice, and Strache says for us Viennese, whereas Heupel says for more immigration. You have also the use of color, and so. Uh, we might ask if we analyze something like this, what is this here in the background, uh, who are these you, uh, why us, and who are these us, uh, what is this church and what does it symbolize, and why dual. And I will get to come to this later on uh, when analyzing 
this in detail. So the guiding questions for my talk today is why is this kind of political rhetoric successful? And there are obviously successful. Mr. Strache has about 20% uh, in the opinion polls right now in Vienna, uh, which is one fifth of the population, and uh, the across Europe, these right-wing populist parties uh, are gaining uh, in popularity. So, why is, what what does these what does this kind of political rhetoric address? Why uh, are people mobilized through such rhetoric? What, does, what role does context play? Context in many meanings, and I will get to this later on, is such rhetoric only successful in Austria, Italy, Switzerland, or elsewhere, and in what way? What then is the relationship between elite rhetoric, sort of the top-down, which Sturman Dijk talks a lot about, and the many audiences which are addressed. Is there some kind of dialectic between the top down and bottom up? I find that the bottom up is usually neglected, um, and I think this is what we have to actually focus on. And how is resonance between text and audience construed or constructed? And I use this term resonance, which is actually from physics and from the natural sciences, but which has traveled into cultural studies. Uh, Raymond Williams has used this concept and others to address some kind of relationship uh, between the speaker and the hearer, something which resonates, which addresses some kind of associations, meanings, interests of the audience. This term has also been used uh, by Norman Fairclough and by others, but it hasn't really been uh, conceptualized and operationalized. How do we do this? How do we find out why a certain rhetoric is more successful than any other? And I don't mean this now in any causal meaning, because in the social sciences, we will not be able to establish causality, but I mean it in the way of relationships. Everything is multi-determined, but we can establish relationships. So, in this lecture, uh, I will continue now with some definitions of inclusion, exclusion, uh, racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and all these forms of exclusion. I will then speak very briefly about the discourse historical approach to CBA, and you have more information about this on the handout. And then I will uh, actually come to two examples, one election posters, like this one, but some other ones. Second example, voices of migrants, sort of the voices from below, uh, from eight EU countries, which we collected uh, during a large EU project. And finally, I will make and draw some conclusions. In the conclusions, I will also address forms of resistance. How do we, or how could one resist this kind of rhetoric? Okay, now some definitions, and in this whole lecture, I draw on multiple genres, which I will not be able to discuss all. I will focus, as I said, on election posters and everyday conversations, but basically in numerous projects we have collected various data with various genres, and I specifically will address the project Xenophobe, which is here, where Michal Zizhanovsky uh, and Fleur Ulsama worked with me, and the book is coming out about that. Uh, the project Racism in the British Press, which was funded by the ESRC, and Majit, uh, Majit Kostranik and other uh, researchers are here. That was a combination with corpus linguistics as well, and basically visual argumentation where I have been working with John Richardson. Uh, I would like to start out with a quote uh, by Niklas Luhmann, the German sociologist, who uh, states that inclusion and exclusion are the two most
most important meta distinctions, uh, meta unterscheidungen in German, which govern our behavior and our actions. Now, Luhmann is very interested in the way complexity is reduced through various options. One can always choose and select between options, and that helps us reduce complexity, which is something we are all doing. And he claims that the two basic and most important distinctions uh, are inclusion and exclusion, uh, which sort of are very characteristic for all our societies globally, and uh, that we can observe parallel societies developing. Uh, the UK had race riots some years ago, about very much about these parallel societies, but that's also, again, across Europe, uh, where certain groups are not just marginalized, but they are outside of the social system and of all the norms and rules which sort of we uh, have adopted and which we accommodate to. Uh, and this sort of meta distinction, of course, goes through all our everyday activities, not always as uh, salient and significant as with sort of parallel societies, but I would claim that the construction of groups of self and other is fundamental and constitutive for all human communication. Uh, it doesn't have to be negative. I mean, we always are self and other without having negative connotations, but of course we distinguish others from a certain age on, uh, and uh, this is how we communicate in sort of reducing the complexity and constructing groups discursively. Uh, racism, xenophobia, discrimination only happens when the others are then negatively evaluated and if certain characteristics are generalized to this other group. But, you know, distinguishing between us and them, that is normal. We all do this and it's trivial. So, to get this kind of negative uh, uh, connotations, uh, we do have to distinguish between two levels of racism, discrimination, exclusion. On the one hand, the level of ideology and beliefs, but it doesn't stay there. There is also the level of social practices, which are informed by these uh, belief systems. They don't always have to be ideologies in the old sense, Mannheim, etc., of consistent belief systems. What we observe today with the right-wing populist movements across Europe are very fragmented, contradictory uh, sort of uh, beliefs uh, which uh, don't have this form of the so-called traditional big narratives. And the level of social practices is informed by these beliefs, justified and legitimized. How you exclude people through legal, uh, through laws, through citizenship laws, through uh, apartheid laws, etc., etc. So I would propose that there are six salient characteristics of discriminatory rhetoric. I will not be able to go into all of these, but I will show you examples about these. The first one is positive self and negative other presentation, uh, something we, many people have worked about. When we try to discriminate others, we sort of characterize them in negative ways on many dimensions and us uh, in very positive ways. That is what politicians usually do. This is also not surprising. They have to get votes. They have to be elected. So it's not surprising that this strategy is used. Again, the question is how it is used, not that it is used. The second important characteristic is denial. Denial of racism, xenophobia, sexism, antisemitism, etc. Uh, we usually get these disclaimers, and that depends on the formality of the context. I have nothing against Jews, Turks, blah, 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 but. And then we all know already that this but 
uh, indicates that some kind of prejudicial occurrence will follow, or my best friends are, or my best son, and so forth. We all know uh, these kinds of disclaimers. Uh, justification and legitimation strategies which justify exclusion and inclusion and again just from the rhetoric on immigration we know the typical uh, topoi and metaphors like the boat is full uh, and other we, they abuse our system etc which justify for the public in accountable ways why certain groups are included and others are excluded. Then the so-called homeland rhetoric, the salience of dates, uh, which uh, of course Piotr works about a lot, um, and Paul Chilton, um, how is the us and then the here and there defined and in which kind of spatial temporal ways Michael Billick has pointed to the salience of this kind of rhetoric in his book about nationalism because nationalism is always tied to this here and uh, sort of the positive uh, construction of the us and the here and this home. Uh, then the, I would like to point to the dialectic relationship between <coughs> formality of context and degree of explicitness. Uh, in our studies, we have been able to show that the more formal a situation is, the more indirect uh, utter prejudiced utterances will occur. In parliaments, in political speeches, you will rarely hear blunt, blatant, uh, racist utterances, but of course in everyday situations, in the pub, uh, anonymous calls, etc., you will have a high degree of explicitness. It also varies due to the groups oppressed. Yeah, so some groups might be uh, pointed to in very indirect ways because of certain taboos and others not, which is obviously the case in Italy right now, that the Roma can be very explicitly uh, excluded and there are no taboos about that. And finally, what I call syncretic racism or anti-Semitism, uh, I believe that the forms of exclusion nowadays are different than the traditional anti-Semitism or racism which was primarily biological or in, the, in uh, relation to anti-Semitism also religious. Uh, nowadays politicians draw on various stereotypes like whatever they need. They're, so one could imagine that they have a large bag and they sort of just pick whatever stereotype is just necessary and can be functionalized for specific interests. And this is what I mean with this expression syncretic. So now just uh, briefly to the discourse historical approach in CDA. As I already mentioned, there is a lot on your handout. You don't have to read it now. And I uh, have started out with this approach, um, I guess, about uh, 20 years ago, uh, when we did research about the so-called wartime affair in Austria, about Austrian anti-Semitism in the public sphere. Since then, we have developed this approach. And as I've already said, Martin has been very influential also in this development. First, because we have a conference about critique here, I would like to say a few words about critique. Uh, CDA is very often misunderstood in relationship to what critique might mean. Many people think that that is something negative, yeah? and so CDA is always doing these negative things. Yeah? We're criticizing uh, uh, societies or politicians or whatever, as you know, sort of the critique in the common sense meaning of the word. But actually, critique, if you look at uh, the etymology, and obviously comes from Greek, it means sort of to debate, to discuss, to make distinctions. It doesn't mean just being negative about something. And I think that this meaning has been very much taken up by critical theory 
So that actually means we're not taking things for granted. We're challenging everyday notions, but we're making more distinctions, but we are not actually only making things negative. So uh, it's important to know that this common sense meaning doesn't apply in that way. Uh, it's also interesting to know that crisis etymology is sort of a turning point between two separate conditions. It first came up in health, uh, in illnesses, where you have a high fever and a turning point between being very ill, dying, or surviving. And uh, crisis is one of the things we all like to study because many uh, norms and rules are challenged and come, are foregrounded, which are otherwise taken for granted. So it's important to uh, really look at the meaning of these notions. Uh, we distinguish between three levels of critique. First of all, looking at inconsistencies, dilemmas in the text itself. Secondly, embedding the text in the context and looking at whatever persuasive uh, features uh, these discursive practices might have. And then, as a third step, and I think this is very important for people doing critical research, trying to improve something. That means doing something to apply the results as well. Just Not just staying in academia, but venturing out of the ivory tower and actually doing something. That might be, uh, for example, um, devising guidelines for non-sexist language behavior. There are many things one can do, work together with practitioners. Uh, I know that we're not expected to do this. Our work is academic, but we should simplify and translate it so that others understand it and not only our peer groups. Uh, secondly, defining discourse. Franz already mentioned that yesterday that this defining discourse is of course complicated. Uh, Martin and I have talked a lot about this, but we've always defined discourse as topic related, as related towards a macro topic. Structures of knowledge related towards a macro topic and realized in many unique texts and genres. So uh, you might have a discourse, for example, on racism, which can be manifest in many genres, from policy papers to parliamentary debates, etc. And every text then is unique. Uh, I, it is, I find it very helpful to talk about discourse in that way and not to talk about racist, sexist, and I don't know whatever other discourses because the salient features are not to be found anymore. Are these the lexical items? How do you distinguish one discourse then from the other? So I think the sort of focus on the macro topic is really salient. Moreover, we believe that discourses endorse a multi-perspectivity. That means uh, that it because it covers all kinds of genres and texts about a certain topic, you will find different positions. So you will find talking about, uh, I don't know, national identity in whatever country, you will find various positions, various narratives, various opinions, and that is all framed under this discourse about this particular national identity. So that, I find that also important because usually we also find expressions like liberal discourse, traditional discourse, conservative discourse, and I don't know what. And it always poses itself this question, what is meant? How are these really studied and operationalized? And in that way, I do hope that that, that makes sense also in the analytical work. Finally, I've already mentioned that uh, discourse implies patterns, texts are specific and unique realizations, uh, and text belongs to various genres, and texts create sense when read in connection with knowledge of the world. And here I come back now to my notion of resonance. Only when we have the shared knowledge 
do texts make sense? And of course, we have different ranges of shared knowledge. Texts insinuate various knowledges. And in that way, that explains why we understand the same text in very different but very systematic ways. To do this, elements are recontextualized. So uh, every text is always in a continuum with other texts synchronically and diachronically, and these elements travel. They move from uh, one text, one context, one field to another. And in this way, we have arguments which in the sort of link text to each other. And coming back to my notion of resonance, recontextualized elements are then transformed according to the receiving context. They are not just imposed, they have to dialectically uh, sort of accommodate to the context where they are implemented. And I will give examples in a minute. I'm coming back to my first poster. Uh, where many readings are possible, and I just want to indicate a few. I know much more can be said about this poster, but I have no time to do this, and it also wouldn't really make sense. Interesting is that this mosque is a fictive mosque. It doesn't exist in Vienna in that way, but it was created as sort of the right hand of the spectrum. Uh, Mr. Heupel symbolizes the mosque, it's quasi metonymically connected, uh, and the mosque symbolizes Islam. Okay? And we also have a red color here, which is on the one hand the socialist party, and on the other hand, danger. Yeah? So for more immigration, it doesn't say how much immigration, just more, which also indicates it could be enormous. Yeah? But more is vague. See here who are addressed, you have the choice, me as a person in Vienna, means we the real Viennese, as opposed to who's the unreal Viennese person. Well, if we continue looking, the real Viennese seem to be only Catholics because they're symbolized by this Stephanskirche, the big Catholic cathedral, and Mr. Strache who says for us Viennese. Again, connected metonymically with this church. So the real Viennese, obviously we can answer the question, are Christians and basically only Catholics for this person. We have the duel, which is a war metaphor, so they will fight, but it also indicates uh, duels amongst fraternity members, and that is a very specific Austrian meaning, which I cannot now explain in all details, but many academics, male academics, Christians, are part of such fraternities which still duel, they fence. Yeah? Uh, and these sort of very traditional fraternities are very right-wing, and they have strong networks. So Mr. Schrafe, as everybody knows, who is Viennese, is part of such a fraternity, and in that way, the duel has a literal and a metaphorical meaning. But of course, you know, only know that if you share that knowledge and if that resonates. And that's why I'm trying to say there are different meanings, different understandings due to the shared knowledge and to the deconstruction of such presupposed knowledge. Uh, so if we continue, and I really would like to make this one of my uh, important points here, uh, texts resonate. That rhetoric, rhetoric is successful because it links to such shared sets of shared knowledge and it speaks to these indirect or presupposed meanings. Now, just taking up one of Van Dyck's definitions, shared beliefs satisfying the epi specific epistemic criteria of an epistemic community uh, presuppositions address that knowledge. And of course, politicians use presuppositions a lot because it needs strategically packaging information. So this is one of my explanations why this works. 
because it addresses salient pools of knowledge for different audiences. So in some, uh, when we analyze texts, and now I will come to more examples, we draw on first the historical analysis, we have to contextualize these various utterances, we have to draw on collective memories, context models in the sense of Turnbull Dyer, because it's not an objective context, it's a perceived context, which is important. Then we have to embed this into the sociopolitical analysis. We go on to the genre, the setting, the context, and finally deconstruct the uh, utterances in all possible linguistic means, which are salient for, these, for this rhetoric. So now I would like to come to some examples, and I would first like to come to some visual examples. Just to contextualize these, these examples are from an election campaign in the city south of Vienna, Graz, this year, 2008. Uh, and I would just like to mention that 1989 was sort of the watershed when xenophobia really started in the EU and in the Western countries, when the migrants from the former communist countries came, but not as refugees anymore, but as so-called economic migrants. Yeah? So they just wanted a better life, basically. And that led to the first really big waves of xenophobia uh, across the EU, and especially also in Austria. In 2000, 2002, we had the first right-wing government where this Freedom Party was part of it. Also, salient EU enlargement, uh, where again, big fears constructed of many new migrants. And uh, now, uh, we have a grand coalition which is just falling apart and Austria will have new elections uh, in September. So this is just to show you sort of a bit of the socio-political uh, atmosphere in Austria. So I want to show you three posters now, uh, which are intertextually related. I will again, um, of course, translate. Here you have uh, the leader of the second part of the former Freedom Party, Westenthaler, <coughs> and his sort of sub-leader, and they are proposing that they are cleansing Graz. And this term, Säubern, and I will come back to this, is a term which has widely been used by the Nazis for extermination of Jews and Roma and disabled people. And here on the bottom, you have nouns, abstract nouns, uh, telling us sort of that they, what are they sweeping away with this room? Uh, corruption by the political parties, abuse of asylum, uh, beggars, and criminality of foreigners. Uh, in the background, you have one of the nice Schloss castles of Graz, and the orange is the uh, color of this party. So this, these two people are proposing to cleanse Graz, and they intertextually related. You find a couple of other posters, and I've just taken two now. We find this generic Marcesz, who's obviously Polish, uh, a generic name, and we have him masked. So in opposition to the former faces which we see, here we don't see him, he has this balaclava, and what he says is, please don't elect or don't vote for this BZÖ so that I can continue uh, doing my business. And the business is what it says here, serial car thief. Okay? And connected to this, and then there are others, but I'm just going to stay with these three, is Amir Z. Again, a generic name, of obviously from Africa, because he's dark. He has this blindfolded, so again, we don't see him. Yeah? And he's smoking, and here he says, please don't elect, don't vote for the BZÖ so that I can 
continue doing my business. And he, Amir Zek, is a asylum seeker and drug dealer. Okay. Now, these three posters were put up all around the city of Graz, uh, and there was no way, uh, there were no anti-discrimination laws or something, nothing could be done, because the visual just insinuates, yeah? Everything we construct in meanings, you know, could be there, but might not be there, etc. So now I would like to really turn to an analysis of these posters. And just uh, to quote Blair, not Tony Blair, of course, uh, <laughs> visual arguments constitute the species of visual persuasion in which the visual elements overlie, accentuate, render vivid and immediate and otherwise elevate in forcefulness a reason or set of reasons for modifying a belief in attitude or one's conduct. <coughs> so there is persuasive argumentation contained in these images. I can only point to some features, also drawing on Francis' uh, pragma dialectics. Um, and visual arguments are even more persuasive, this is what Blair proposes, than text. So if we first look at a brief analysis of these three posters, especially those generic uh, Wojciech and Amir, we see that referential strategies have been used to anonymize and construct these figures as generic types. They have foreign sounding names, uh, so that attributes them to some kind of different part of, of the world. And this nominalization also attributes negative generic characteristics, serial car thief, etc. Then we have an intensified criminalization, uh, which is also sort of intensified through negative anthroponyms in the way that we have sort of these terrible businesses which they are doing. We have the use of various topoi in the sense of argumentative shortcuts, commonplaces, burdening our society, or they're taking advantage of us, yeah, the abuse of asylum, etc. So there are many argumentative top commonplaces addressed. Finally, we could do a multimodal analysis, look at the contrast between orange and the dark, darkness below, uh, absolutely in the sense of press and van Leuven. So if we look at all this together, and this is just a small part of what we can do, we find metaphorical, metonymic, and pragmatic devices across these three posters. Now I would like to show you just a bit in this one poster how that works. Uh, the slogan on the top, uh, we are cleansing Graz, implies already material verb, activity. They are not only proposing it, they are already doing it. This is very important and it implies indirectly if you vote for us we will install law and order because we're cleansing the city from all these terrible things. Uh, the, as I've already said, the verb Säubern, cleansing, insinuates Nazi jargon. This is a, again presupposed shared knowledge which probably most people like especially in my generation will know, an older generation, I don't know if all the young generation will know that. So again, addressing different audiences. And I've looked up uh, Zoyman in various lexica and encyclopedia of National Socialism. That is one of the euphemisms used for extermination. And everybody in the German-speaking countries will know that. It's really a taboo word. Uh, we have the metaphor of cleansing, yeah, with the broom. And a very interesting implicature by contrast, an insinuation to Jews cleaning the streets in Graz on their knees with toothbrushes. Now that is an iconic image which people learn in schools. We know that 1938 when the uh, Nazis took over Austria, uh, with the consent of most Austrians, 
that Jews were forced to clean streets with toothbrushes, and you have here the cleansing with the same word, the street with brooms. Yeah, so there might be an implicature by contrast. And for most people, again, we've asked people, this is the case. There is this subtext, this iconic subtext, which one knows from Austrian history. Then there is intertextual relation to the other posters, these generic figures on other posters. And finally, we have these two men who are white and clean, active and happy, gazing at us, even kind of like as, uh, at, as looking as if they would do it for us, yeah, with this sort of inviting smile. Uh, their faces are uncovered, so we know who they are, they're identified, whereas the other people are not identified. They only have this generic name. So here you have this positive self-presentation, and you have the negative other presentation. Uh, humanized, active, white, uh, dehumanized, dark. <coughs> Slavs, Arab, and um, people from Africa, black. So you see that just by deconstructing this in various parts, we, and one could do much more with this poster, you have a very strong visual argumentation. Uh, and we claim, John Richardson and I, we've, done, we've compared these posters to posters of the BNP, who are similar and different. I don't want to go into this. We claim that this is coordinatively compound argumentation. That means that the pictorial and linguistic elements together constitute a defense uh, of the standpoints only in combination with one another. You can't just take the visual or the verbal. You need both of it together in this very specific Austrian context. Because in a different context, you would not have all these meanings associated with it and not so much shared knowledge would be implied. So if we look now at the argumentative chain, uh, we have the Betet Ö cleans the streets and keeps our city clean. Wojciech, a Polish migrant, steals cars as his daily business. If you vote for this party, Wojciech will not be able to continue stealing. Hence, Wojciech and all other criminals oppose the Betet Ö. Voting for the BZÖ will establish clean orange streets once more. BZÖ stands for law and order. Yeah? So you have a very clear argumentative pattern inherent in these visual posters. So I would very briefly just point to one example and then go to my conclusions of the voices from below, uh, which was part of a big project across eight European EU countries, uh, from Sweden to Poland to Cyprus, Austria, UK, France, Spain, and so forth. And we looked at very many data, employment, housing, and whatever, but we also did 49 focus groups uh, spread across these countries with various migrant groups, and uh, which are the, were the most, the biggest ones the salient ones for each of these countries, talking to them about everyday experiences. And I would just like to uh, show you from this insight perspective what people relate, what kind of stories they come up. I'm not able to you know, investigate if these stories have really occurred. It's enough to have them related as subjective perceptions or experiences. Now first, this story where this woman talks about an experience she had in the tram uh, where somebody was behind her, uh, she had her child uh, and the bike in her hand or something I can't remember, and then she talks sweetly to the child. Yes, right away I thought she wants to say something, say something nice because she also said it loud, and she goes, they are Trujan, say Trujan to them. Now, Trujan means uh, foreigner, comes from the Slavic Trujoy, uh, which means stranger, and is an abusive word for foreigners in Viennese dialect. And so in this story, in this scenic narrative 
from this woman, she actually shows how the mother teaches her child how to distinguish the others and also to discriminate them and abuse them with this offensive word. Now, you rarely get such examples of being socialized into othering. And so, but we had several of them. We have a huge corpus. I'm not cherry picking now. This is just uh, one or two examples. So, this is really how this child was socialized. And also, look at the contrast between expectations and experiences, which is how this story is performed. Uh, I would just like to give you a couple of instances also which occurred frequently in our materials in all countries, all eight countries, the problem of the gaze, how people look at foreigners, and actually that many foreigners and many people uh, address the, the, the request, which the implicit request that they should not be visible, they should vanish. And they find this gaze extraordinarily obtrusive and offensive. Like uh, this Pakistan woman in the UK, it can be hard to feel really at home in Britain. People look at you like you sometimes, like you shouldn't be there. So this, I find, resonates totally with the posters where we have these hidden faces of foreigners. Be it Burkas in the in the case of BNP posters where women, Muslim women are always shown covered up with veils, or be it our generic Wojciech and Amir, who also we don't know. And so we have this gaze which seems to discriminate and which is experienced in extraordinarily discriminating ways. And uh, you can look at the others. We have very many instances of this kind. This is absolutely a salient experience of foreigners. So let me come to my conclusions. Uh, I've already mentioned that the discursive construction of us and them is the basis of inclusion and exclusion. Just having construction of groups is trivial because it's fundamental to human communication. Important is the way this construction then is elaborated and which characteristics are attributed to the one or other group. And in that way, the sort of process of prejudice uh, works in the way that first social actors are labeled, Amir, Wojcic, whoever, uh, then these negative attributions are generalized, so all Poles, all Jews, all Turks, etc. are like this. Uh, every story is evidence for all, whereas good stories are exceptions, so stories have various functions due to their, what they want to convey. And then we have arguments and topoi to justify the inclusion and exclusion, and you have lists of these arguments and topoi in your handout. I will not go into this, but you, I've mentioned several, like the topos of abuse, topos of culture, they don't want to integrate, they are abusing our system, and so forth. And thirdly, that these realizations vary in explicitness, first of all, due to the formality of the situation, due to historical conventions, due to the immediate context, due to norms of political correctness. So you can say certain things against Roma, but not against another group. Uh, and due to the levels of tolerance, respect, and recognition of foreigners in all these societies, uh, or of others, because it's not only foreigners, it's, it's also obviously minorities who live, religious minorities who live in these countries. So let me end with an example of resistance. Uh, and I have to thank Johnny again for helping me cut certain images from a DVD. And I just want to end with a brief story. Uh, there's a German artist whose name is Schlingensief, uh, and who's very well known for being very eccentric and for staging performances. And in the year 2000, 
he decided to stage an event in Vienna one week during the Viennese festival of music usually and theater. That was the year where the right-wing government was formed. And from the 11th of June until the 18th of June, uh, he put up a container in the front of the Vienna Opera. In this container, 12 asylum seekers were, were supposed to live. And these were actually um, actors, but they were staged as asylum seekers. Posters were out there with their names. Uh, they were all sort of very saliently recognizable as specific generic foreigners. And daily, through call in, two asylum seekers could be selected to be deported by the Austrian public. And about 100,000 people called in every day. And so that was filmed like Big Brother. And one could see how these two selected quasi asylum seekers were deported uh, by the securities and put into a huge black car and obviously driven away. The media focused on this enormously. It led to huge scandalization of all kinds, uh, which was, of course, what he wanted. And uh, the uh, explicit aim was staging an event every day so that Austria wakes from its sleeping beauty sleep, Don Röschen Schlaf, and to provoke this right-wing government, which was imposing a lot of new laws for to restrict immigration, etc. So you can imagine this one week in the center of town, and that looked like this. Now this is this is the Vienna Opera, which is in the center of town. Uh, this was the container, and here you see masses of people because that was sort of day and night uh, collecting around there, and suddenly starting to discuss. Furiously, what was happening? Sort of some of them angry, some of them pro asylum seekers, some of them against asylum seekers, some of them embarrassed about Austria, some of them uh, implying that this was putting Austria into a bad light, yeah, dirtying the nest, because also the international media, of course, caught on that, and politicians came to visit. And here I have some. Uh, sort of snapshots of the discussions which evolved spontaneously. Uh, here you have some of the international headlines. Here somebody uh, climbed up this container to put graffiti on it and say, you know, we're against racism. This was the poster, uh, Foreigners Out, which was sort of um, the motto, the label of this whole activity or event. This is an image from inside the container where they sit at these 12 asylum seekers which get less and less uh, during the week. Here you have this woman who absolutely screams and shouts and is an extraordinary xenophobic and people watch her. Uh, and this is Mr. Schlingensief who from time to time sort of takes a loudspeaker and tries to calm or announce something, like now we will, uh, these two people will again be deported. And this was sort of the, again, somebody, one of the 12 who has been uh, sort of driven away. So there's a whole film about it because this was constantly uh, in the media like the Big Brother. So you had sort of things happening in the container. At one point, uh, spontaneously, uh, some people came together to rescue uh, the people inside the container <laughs> and they uh, sort of ran there and climbed onto the container. And now, uh, I mean, I could go on and on and tell, telling you this story, but what does this story tell us? And I think it's a very interesting uh, event as illustration and evidence for what I've been trying to convey about resonance and different meanings and how they are perceived and uh, understood. 
on the one hand, what becomes visible spontaneously, so this mobilized something without any preparation, it just happened. Uh, this mobilized uh, an opposition to the new laws and right-wing politics became visible, yeah? because there was all these debates going on, the attempt to rescue those people, etc. At the same time, the racist beliefs become visible, yeah? because there are all these people who think that's right, and who phone in, and who want these people to be uh, deported, and who select some. Then there was also uh, a huge wave of aggression against this German, who's again telling these Austrians what to do. And yeah? the Austrians don't like that. Uh, and Finally, it was viewed as an isolated event which caused huge media coverage, which was, of course, a very important effect. And this genre has now been appropriated for other events, anti-racist events, not specifically to build this container, but to somehow catch media attention. People have recognized that, obviously, just argumentative scholarly work won't really help. Uh, but getting the attention of media, mobilizing, might help. So what does this mean for our theories and on uh, prejudice, racism, and so forth? And uh, this is what I would like to conclude my talk with, top down or bottom up. Uh, in my view, recontextualization works both ways. On the one hand, Political slogans are successful because they match audience expectations. They mobilize existing shared knowledge and meaning and in some way can be functionalized because they speak, they mobilize a potential which is out there. And this is what I would like to call resonance. This potential is not just some vague thing, it's presupposed and shared collective knowledge and indirect meanings, which is addressed in various groups, various meanings. So various audiences are actually addressed in different ways because they share various meanings and knowledges. And the success is due to the mobilization. Now I find that very important, not only of cognition, but emotion. This, what you have seen, is emotional. Uh, so how do how does anti-racist, how does resistance work? Certainly not only by enlightenment, not only by rationality, unfortunately, but very much also by emotions. And I think this is what this event shows, that that is what needs to happen, so that something starts which one then can take up in a rational way. And so there must be a combination. But just to rely on our usual rational cognitive argumentation obviously will not help to uh, uh, convince people which we have seen on these images. And that for me lastly implies that models of text production and text comprehension, which I have been working on for also certainly 15 years, require the integration of context, shared knowledge, emotion and discourse. So without sort of this kind of interdisciplinary mix, uh